Kings chapter number 4, 2 Kings chapter 4. <clears throat> We're dealing with part 2 tonight, God's deliverance of in desperate situations. We saw this morning a uh, widow who was uh, the wife of a preacher, a prophet, and this uh, husband has died. So this woman went to Elisha. She's crying out for help. And she told uh, Elisha the situation. She's in financial peril. Uh, she's in major trouble. And uh, so we talked this morning about how God, we began to talk about how God can begin to deliver people in difficult situations. And we talked about the legacy of her husband, that this man feared the Lord. And so we spent considerable time on your name, your legacy. And so we're going to pick up where we left off this morning. So let's pray. We'll get into it. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to worship you, to uh, gather as a church family to, around your word and to learn some things that will help us to be better Christians. Lord, help us to have a reverence and fear for you like this woman's husband who loved you very much. Now we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this widow told Elisha that her husband feared the Lord. Now, what does that actually mean to fear the Lord? How does fearing the Lord affect a person's life? When we look at Bible principles about fearing God, we can get a good basic idea of what the widow's husband was like. A fearful reverence for the Lord brings blessing to your life and those around you. Now the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord. And it talks about the impact that it can have on your life. For example, it leads to rationale or thinking that is wise. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom begins with God. That's where these educational uh, uh, institutions today are having their problems. They leave God out of the equation. And no wonder they're training fools in these schools that don't even know what sex they are. Uh, fear of the Lord leads to a relationship with the Lord and knowing Him. Proverbs 2.5, thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. A reverence of God helps you to develop a relationship with God. Number three, it involves a revulsion and departure from evil. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Proverbs 16, 6. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. A fear of God and fooling around with sin... Those things do not go hand in hand. They cannot coexist. Number four, the fear of the Lord leads to rejuvenated health and long life. If you want to have a great health care plan, then make sure that part of your plan is a respect and a reverence for God Almighty. Proverbs uh, chapter 10, 27 says, The fear of the Lord prolongeth days. Proverbs 3, 7, Be not wise in thy own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. God says, you fear me, you reverence me, it'll affect your health. By the way, if you don't do that, it'll affect your health too. When you don't live for God, it drains your body of strength. Something else about the fear of the Lord. It leads to refuge or security. Proverbs 14, 26. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and His children shall have a place of refuge. So fearing God, having that reverence for God, gives security in a person's life. It leads to riches, happiness, and honor. Proverbs 22, 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life, the Bible says. Proverbs 28, 14. Happy is the man that feareth always. And face it, that's what people are looking for today. They're looking for all these things. They're looking for wealth. They're looking for happiness and joy. Well, it's found in the fear and a reverence for God. That's what God says. Not only that, 
the fear of the Lord leads to rejoicing and praise from your family and from your friends. Proverbs 31 verse 30 says, Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised, the Bible says. So these are some of the blessings of fearing God, having a, re a reverence for God in your life. Well, that brings us to a third thing tonight. Look at 2 Kings 4. Look at verse 1 again, the latter part of the verse. We see the desperation from the widow's debt. She says, the creditor, she tells Elisha, the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. You know, the sheriff's office in Pineless County, Florida, is dealing with a typographical mistake that has been heard around the world. For several months, nobody noticed the mistake imprinted on the welcome mat of the sheriff's station. But that all changed when a deputy spotted the error on the rug. This rug, is five, was, it was a $500 rug. $500 rug, and it inadvertently carried the phrase, in dog we trust. The company responsible for manufacturing this rug is correcting the wording while the simple doormat will live on in viral infamy on the internet. It'll never go away. Now it's a mistake that any of us could make and some sort poor soul has no doubt had a hard time explaining how he or she inverted those letters. I'd hate to be the person responsible for the mistake. But in reality, if you think about it, we've all been guilty of the same thing, but on a far worse scale. Maybe we spelled it differently. But the effect was the same. We substituted something else for God. Many Christians make that mistake. They put things in God's place where the Lord should be first. When we look at this widow, we find that she did not make this mistake at all. The widow got to the heart of her distress and desperation. She was in financial peril. How many of you have ever been in financial peril? How many of you have been in that boat? Would you raise your hand? I think many of us have, yeah. Now, this woman did not turn to alcohol. She did not turn to drugs. She did not turn to horoscopes, gambling. She did not call the Psychic Friends Network, palm readers for solutions. She did not go to an unsaved, godless psychiatrist to cope with her needs. She didn't do any of that. Now those are common substitutes people use today to try to solve their problems and they usually end up creating more problems for themselves. So what did she do? She turned to the Lord and sought out God's man for counsel. Turning to the Lord for solutions is the wisest decision that you can make in your life. You got a problem? Turn to God first. I don't care how big it is, okay? Even if it's a little problem, turn to the Lord. I mean, Wednesday night, it was time to go home. I could not find my car keys. I wanted to go home, and I had no clue. You know, normally they're in the briefcase. They were not in there. And I'm going, oh, no. Where are those keys? And I thought, maybe I've locked them in the office, but all the officers were gone. And I surely didn't want to call John or somebody say, I need you to come back to church. I need to look in the office. My keys might be in there, but I'm not sure. So instead of doing that, here's what I did. Lord, I can't find my keys. I need some help. Would you show me where they're at? That's what I did. You prayed about that? Yes! 
Five seconds later, I found the keys. He said, go to, the, go to the baptistry dressing room. I said, okay, I will go. I went in there, right, went back to the back chair, and there they were sitting there right on the chair. And they were going, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it was, it was so nice to be able to say, Lord, I don't know where they're at, and just show me where to go. And, he, and, and I just felt impressed to go right back there, and there they were. That prayer was answered in five seconds. Wouldn't it be great if all our prayers were answered in five seconds? Wouldn't that be wonderful? But you know what? God solved that problem. You know, beloved, the Bible is a treasure chest of wisdom for us. Well, with the death of her husband, the debts began to pile up at the house while the food pantry continued to diminish. The widow got so far behind on her bills that the lender was on the verge of taking her two sons to be slaves to work off her debt. Her sons were collateral for the debt and they were about to be taken away, to be taken out of the home. Now in Bible days, this was allowed under the Jewish law to protect the lender uh, with certain specific conditions. In fact, here's what Deuteronomy 15, 12 says. And if thy brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. And when thou sendest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy winepress. Of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto him. Now, this situation reveals that the Jewish law recognized the responsibility of those who borrowed money. Those people were to satisfy their creditors. There's a lot of borrowing money today where people just don't pay the loans back. By the way, you end up paying for it because the bank charges higher fees because they make crummy loans. In other words, God wants us to pay our bills. You borrow money, God says you pay it back. You pay it back. This lender could have been greedy. He could have been vengeful. Or both sons were needed because her debt was so huge. But with both boys out of the home, there would be no one to take care of this widow. So she's in a pickle. Now this story shows us that the Lord is concerned about those who are poor, those who might be unnoticed by other people. You do not, ha you do not have to be famous, well-known, popular or connected with important people to get God's attention. You don't have to be in that way. Jesus proved that when he pointed out the widow in the temple that put two mites, two pennies in the offering, giving all that she had to the Lord, Jesus proved that you don't have to be a big shot to get his attention. So we see something else here. We see a fourth thing. Look at 2 Kings 4. Look at verse 2 now. The disposal of service is offered to the widow. It says in verse 2 at the beginning, And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? The last time we heard this question, it was Elijah asking it to Elisha. So with a servant's spirit, Elisha asked the woman what he could do to help her out. I believe that this woman did know Elisha. They may have been friends since he knew her husband before he died. And Elisha's attitude demonstrated his greatness as a man. He had a serving spirit. Matthew 23, 11 says, He that is greatest among you uh, shall be your servant. Galatians 5, 13, For brethren, you have been called under liberty. Only use 
not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, to live a sinful lifestyle. But by love, he says, serve one another. Now let's, let's talk about that for a moment. For example, in January 1989, uh, the issue of the Servant magazine was published. And a pastor shared the following story about having a serving spirit with other people. He said, I was at the, the supermarket one day and a lady came down the aisle whom I could barely see over the top of her groceries. I mean, her cart, her grocery cart was packed to the brim. I got someone somewhat frightened because she seemed to be heading right straight for me. She screeched to a halt within a few feet of me. She peered over her load, wagged her finger, and said, I left your church. I left your church. So I said, well, if it's my church, I think that was a very wise decision. And if it's my church, I think I'm going to go ahead and leave it too. Now, he's the pastor, okay? She said, well, don't you want to know why I left? He said, no, not particularly, but I think I'm going to find out pretty quick. And I was right, he said. She said, you were not meeting my needs. I answered, I don't ever recollect seeing you before, let alone talking to you, let alone knowing your needs. Did you ever tell anyone specifically what your needs were? Well, she couldn't recall that she had done that. So he said, I raised another question. She said, he said, can you tell me if we have 5,000 people sitting in that church, all with the same attitude that you've got right now, how are anyone's needs going to be met in that church? See, if you reserve the right to have the attitude that you have right now, then you must give everybody the freedom to have that attitude also. If everybody has that attitude, if all 5,000 people in the church have that attitude, who on earth is going to do all this need meeting in the church? Well, standing her ground, she demanded, well, then you tell me who will. Who will meet those needs? And the pastor, relieved, said, I thought you would never ask. He says, this is what will work. When people stop sitting in the pew saying, they're not meeting my needs, they're not meeting my needs. And if the people will start saying, whose needs can I meet? Then people's needs will be met. When the servant spirit flour flourishes in a church family, and that's what we have here tonight, a church family, then they minister to each other and they do it as unto the Lord. And what that pastor said is exactly true. So let me ask you, do you have a servant attitude just like Elisha had? How about, how about you kids that are here tonight? Is your attitude with your mom and dad always about you? Do for me. Give me. Give me. Give me. Give me. Why not try doing this for your mother and father? Ask your parents what you can do for them. Ask your parents what you can do to be a blessing to them. And I'll tell you what, if you do that and really mean that, you'll be a blessing to them. 
And uh, you will find happiness and you will find fulfillment in your own life being a blessing just to your own family. Well, we see a fifth thing tonight. Look at chapter 4, verse 2 again. We see the dregs of provision. <clears throat> Elisha says, Tell me, what hast thou in thy house? And she said, Thy handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. So Elisha asked her what she had in the house. He wanted an inventory of tools or resources. And as we will see, he's going to help this widow help herself. He does not give her any money. He doesn't do that here. She was going to have to do some work. She was not going to get something for nothing. See, when you get something for nothing, that destroys the character of a person. And that is what our government is doing to our nation. When we have a welfare plan that gives people something for nothing, then they, it destroys their character, it destroys any motivation to work. You know, it's interesting, the states that have changed their welfare plan and have started saying, yeah, you can get on welfare, but you're going to have to work for the, the money. It's amazing how many people get off the welfare rolls. And that's, that's been on the news. You know, Matthew Henry said, the best way to help the poor is to help them improve their lives by their own industry and own ingenuity. Help them to help themselves. People need to use wisdom in their decisions, make adjustments in their lifestyles, and use their abilities that they have to make a living. Help somebody use their abilities, teach them, show them what they can do to get on their own two feet and not have to depend on somebody else. Well, this is what Elisha instructs the widow to do, as we will see in a moment. You know, the only thing of any value was one pot of olive oil in the house. But as we will see, that one pot was enough. See, little is big when God is in it. This pot of oil was not made in the fantastic factory of miracle pottery. It was not made there. No, that was not stamped on this clay pot. Yet little did the potter realize that the day that he made this jar, forming it and shaping it with his hands on his spinning wheel, he made something that was going to become unusually special in the future. The pot was the item that was available and it was the item that was going to be used in a great way. So great that we're talking about it tonight. As we will see, this pot is a lot like us. We are vessels that God wants to use in special ways. Understand that God wants to use you. He wants to use you and He will use you if you'll let Him use you. In fact, Paul said that we are to be vessels for honor and to be prepared for the Master's use in 2 Timothy 2.21. And one key way to be prepared uh, and to be used by the Lord is to actually be available to Him. The pot was available in the home and God wants us to be available to Him. The available person. He makes His own schedule and priorities secondary to the wishes of those who He is serving. You know, this word available, it comes from an old French term, avalier, which means to be of worth or to be strong. See, availability then is the ability to add strength, to add worth to another person. 
Availability is the quality of one who stands ready to contribute of his or her own strength and talent to another person. Availability is recognizing that it's by making other people successful that I myself become successful. Helping others improve. Availability is not always a matter of duty. It's a voluntary attitude. Do not think of availability as something that you have to do. Or you will destroy the spirit of availability. Availability is something I am happy and willing to do because I am committed to the success or the needs of the person that I'm serving. You know, when it comes to preparing messages and sermons, man, it is hard work putting these messages together. But I don't come to, uh, to the desk and with the, the Bible open and stuff, and I don't come to it saying, oh, brother, another sermon, I got to work on it. You know, I'm not doing that. Uh-uh. I'm saying, okay. What's God got for me today? I can't wait to do that. It's not a drudgery, it's a joy. And that's the way God wants us to serve one another. He wants us to serve with the attitude of joy. The day that, the day that uh, preparing messages and studying the Bible becomes a drudgery in my life, man, I'm not going to be much of a pastor then. And you know what? As a Christian, the day the Bible becomes a drudgery to you, you know what? You're going to stop growing in your Christian life. God wants us not only to have this attitude about serving one another, but He also wants us to have that attitude of availability to Him, being available to Him. The Bible teaches us that we are to be available and ready to serve the Lord. And it's tragic when God's people are unavailable to Him. Isaiah said in Isaiah 63, 5, And I looked... And there was none to help. God help us to always be ready to serve Him. What we need to do is have the attitude of Isaiah who said, Hear my Lord, send me. You know, the following true story reflects the life of a woman who neglected to make herself available to the Lord during, during most of, of her life. But this woman was determined in her latter years to correct her mistake, and she truly wanted to be a servant of the Lord. She wanted to make her life count for Christ. Her life teaches that it's never too late to serve the Lord if that is what you desire to do. Yes, you can lose out on opportunities. You can lose out on blessings. But you know what? God will still use you if you're willing to be used. It's never too late to serve Him. As a 15-year-old girl in 1927, Lois Sechrist promised God that she would go overseas and that she would be a missionary for the Lord, perhaps to Africa, perhaps to India, helping the needy. But Lois never made that trip that she committed to. <clears throat> At the age of 23, she married a guy named Galen Prater. Galen was a very handsome young man. He was a farmhand. But later on, he became a heavy drinker, became an alcoholic. Many years later, Galen did become a Christian, and he testified about the peace of Jesus Christ to his old drinking buddies. But by then, he was, he was almost 80 years old, and he was near death. When he died in January of 1988, Lois' childhood dream of becoming a missionary returned. At first, she resisted the dream. At age 76... She felt her opportunity to serve the Lord overseas as a missionary had slipped away. you got to remember, they're coming home from the mission field when they get that old. She was wanting to go. Lois said, Lord, I'm too old to go now. 
I can't do this. How many of you can understand that statement? Amen. Yeah. But this great grandmother was determined to fulfill her unforgotten promise to God. So Lois, pricked by the memory of ignoring God's calling as a teenager, she would not refuse a second chance at becoming a missionary for the Lord. So here's what she did. She sold everything that she had and she flew off to the Philippines. At age 78, folks, that's two years from 80 years old. At the age of 78, Lois Prater became the unlike, unlikely builder of an orphanage in the, in the Philippines. A lifeline to over 60 children whose lives had been rescued from neglect, begging in the streets, and parental abuse. In fact, this orphanage is surrounded by a six-foot wall that keeps out thieves that would steal from, from their 300 fruit trees, and it keeps out pythons that could kill the children. Not only that, there are communist rebels that roam this region. I mean, it's a real great place for an orphanage. This orphanage is also right smack dab in the middle of the jungle. A Christian school has been established in the orphanage to educate these children and teach them the Bible and teach them about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. She named the orphanage, get this, here's the name. She calls it the King's Garden. I like that. And it's located in Orion, Bataan, Philippines. You know, it's interesting that it's in Bataan because that is where the death march was in World War II where many American soldiers who had to surrender to the Japanese were marched to prison camps and thousands of them were killed in that death march. Well, that place has now become a place of life. Lois built the orphanage without taking a loan Relying instead, get this, she relied on God's provision. Oh, can you imagine that? She relied on God's provision through individual financial support from across the entire United States from private donations. When she was asked if that made her nervous relying upon the Lord, she very confidently said, I serve a mighty God. He's in control. I feel I'm not talented enough to do any of this, but God enables me. She said, my responsibility is just to do what I can. And that is exactly what she did. At the age of 100, on January 10th, 2013, she went home to be with the Lord. But her work for the Lord continues today because she made herself available to God. Boy, if a 78-year-old woman can do that, can you imagine what people who are even younger can do if they just said, by the grace of God, I'm going to do what you want me to do. You know, God doesn't want to hear our, he doesn't want to hear our excuses, does he? He wants to hear, hear my, send me. Let's pray.